Hello, Internet. Welcome to the launch party for The Con by J.D. Delusio. So I'm Catherine Fitzsimmons, the owner of Brain Lag, and we have here with us the author. J.D., like to introduce yourself? Um, um, yeah, well, yeah, I'm well, J.D. I'm J.D. Delusio, uh, or Jeff, or Jeff and, I've and I've written a number written of little, number things, of little here things, things here and there, uh, but... Uh, but why we're here, Why is, we're because here is because I wrote a, I wrote a novel, novel called, called Strange, uh, novel, strange called novel called The Con, and, and that's what we're here, that's what we're to, here launch to launch since we are, since we are, uh, are, uh, are in the world of, of, COVID, of COVID still, still. And, a live and a live launch party was, was just on an event. event. So, so I hope so there's, we have no idea how many people are out there. We hope a lot of you are following along, and you can explain how to do questions through the site. And those of you who know me personally, don't give up my number, but if you know me personally, my cell phone is sitting beside I mean, you can also ask questions, questions later, later, and we will try and, we will and get, try to, all and get to all the questions. Yeah, so um, if you're in the um, chat, feel free to introduce yourself, say hi, uh, and again, if you have any comments or questions, please feel free to share. We'll uh, be sure to answer any questions later in the launch party. Uh, for now, JD, how about you tell us about the con? Tell us about the con. Okay. Okay. Um, okay. Um, <laughs> wasn't expecting that question. Uh, uh, the con is, is um, it's, an um, it's an interesting novel, novel and it will be interesting to see how the different readerships respond to it. It is set, it is set uh, at, a uh, at a hotel in Toronto, in Toronto which, is which is mainly, mainly although we get a lot of flashbacks, lot of flashbacks which, is which is simultaneously hosting a science fiction convention and a smaller, and a smaller meeting, meeting of the Jane Austen Society of North America. And according, and to, the according to the narrator, there is also, there is an, actual also an actual alien presence. presence. And we don't and know, we don't to, what know to what degree this is a Harvey the Rabbit. We don't know to what degree Harvey, Harvey, was, a Harvey was, a was a Harvey the Rabbit. We don't know if the, alien, know if the alien is real or, 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 if he's or if he's imagining things or, or if he's, if he's doing, something doing something else, else conning you, conning so, to you so to speak. Um, um, but it takes a while, for, it takes all a while for all those to elements come to come together. We've got these, We've different, got these strands. different strands. So, so I do wonder, I do you wonder, know, the science, you know, the science fiction fans, there is science fiction, fiction there, but it takes a while to become, to become important. important. Um, um, some of the Jainites some of the might, feel might feel slighted because, because they don't get, they as, don't much get as much time early in the, early novel. In the novel, but, but uh, you, uh, are you are critical. To the conclusion, to the, conclusion, to the climax of the novel, the climax of the climax novel, of the novel would, not would not happen without the Jane, without Austen, the Jane Austen Society. Austen society. Um, um, so, so it's a it's very a strange very strange carnival novel with, all novel with all these different characters and their interrelated and stories, and how those and how those eventually sort of come sort of together, come together in, this, in this way that is way that is kind of important. important. Um, at least important at least important to the, the novel. It is it is. I think meant to be very readable and entertaining, but there are a lot of levels for people who care to look for a lot of levels, and they won't you won't trip over them if you're not interested in that stuff at all. If you just want to read a sort of a crazy story about a bunch of people at a convention, it works, I think, on that level, and indeed I think you guys accepted it on that level. Um, and those of you who look for deeper things or other levels, um, you, you, you can certainly find them there. And in fact, um, I have a short essay-like thing, uh, which will be a guest post at John Scalzi's blog next week, um, the 19th, I think, which talks about the ideas that inform the con, rather than the characters um, and the sort of the, the, the carnivalesque nature, which is, I think, uh, what most people are going to read it for. And, and I'm happy with that. I, that was a rather confusing explanation. Um, I was frantically, well, you asked me, trying to set up so I could see the Skype feed, but I'm not even going to try and do that. Um, I'll just trust that it's running and you can see the questions, and uh, and we'll continue on. So, uh, hi everyone, and if you're there, thank you very much for um, thank you very much for tuning in to um, for tuning in, and uh, uh, very interesting. And I hope to hear your uh, your questions and anything else you might want to ask. Yeah, so uh, there was uh, someone in the chat saying, uh, hi, Jeff, this is exciting, Dan Patterson. And then uh, <laughs> they pointed out that uh, there was a bit of an echo on uh, your voice because of the way I had it set up, but it's all fixed now. Again, I'm, okay. I'm still uh, new to the whole streaming experience. So thank you for letting me know. So... Uh, you know, obviously, as you said, the con is a very interesting 
uh, carnivalesque novel. Uh, what were your inspirations for writing it? Uh, well, I was I was cleaning out the attic, and uh, I found an old dusty box with um, a list of weird ideas for novels. No, uh, you know, it came from all different kinds of places. There was a lot of different writing strands that went into this. Partly, uh, obviously, I've been a science fiction fan and somebody who goes to cons for a very long time. And, well, I participate in that and I enjoy it. I also find it fascinating from an outsider perspective. Uh, you know, there's a moment in the con when, you know, a, a family of, of mundanes, of non-science fiction fans, step in an elevator and the, the daughter is quite pleased by everything she <laughs> sees and the parents have that cornered look that all science fiction fans know when somebody wanders into a, a, a hotel that is sponsoring a con <laughs> and do not realize that that's what they've wandered into. And I've been thinking of that from an outsider's perspective and thinking, um, well, we'll come back to that in a minute. Uh, and then some years later, uh, I'm also a reader of, you know, um, classic literature. So I certainly knew Jane Austen. My wife, Nancy, is a classically trained soprano. And uh, one of the accompanists she works with was very involved in, in uh, Jasna. Many years ago, they thought about doing some performances of period-appropriate music, Regency music, um, for the Jane Austen Society locally. And that got us involved in, in Jasna locally. So I am both a science fiction fan and a card-carrying member of Jasna. And uh, I thought, that's a very different kind of fandom with a very different base, um, but I couldn't help having now been sort of involved in a couple different fandoms. I started thinking how much that resembles religion. Uh, there are holy books, there are saints, and there are a bunch of, the, there are people arguing about minutia. How do we interpret this? How do we interpret that? And both groups, fans and uh, the devout, engage in rituals and activities which are bizarre and terrifying to people who are not members, to outsiders. So I was thinking of that. Um, I was thinking of the different kinds of people. I was on a panel many years ago at, at PenguinCon um, on the levels of fandom, the different kinds of fans that come together at events who aren't necessarily, you know, at one time, if you were a science fiction fan, you, even if you didn't read all the same books as the next person at the con, you knew what they were. You knew who the big names were. Um, you know, you saw that movie that was out last year that was science fiction. And you watched that one television show that was science fiction, even though it was probably crappy and had, you know, a really low budget. And what has happened is that has expanded. So you go to a, a convention now, and there are people with a wide diversity of interests. They're reading um, writers you've never heard of who are great writers. They're just not the people you've read. They're following you know, 10 of the 700 current science fiction or fantasy shows that are different from the maybe the five you've watched. Um, you know, there's a whole often younger fan base that's into the Japanese stuff. Uh, you've got the makers and the craftspeople who are also attracted to science fiction. Uh, and then, of course, in PenguinCon in Michigan, you have the overlap with um, the Linux people and the computer people and the hackers overlapping with science fiction. So you've got these very different groups, and I found that fascinating. So I wanted to do a book that would bring these different groups together. And gradually, I, that became a book that was also, in its own way, a science fiction book, because of the presence of this maybe alien who is a significant character in the book, even if you spend most of the book wondering if the narrator has invented this, or it's actually happening and this is actually something there and there are multiple interpretations and I leave those to the reader because uh, so it, it came out of a lot of different ideas um, it also uh, I had created some of the team characters to just play with in a uh, workshop um, uh, and I thought I could use these characters um, since I created them and they're interesting and I wanted to so I had written a story which is included in the con a number of years ago called Trollbridge which introduced some of those characters and I wanted to do more with them because I thought their world was very interesting and around the time I started getting the idea from the con 
I was then actually working for a short time, for a time, a couple of years, in a small town, a small community, not unlike the one that some of the teenage characters have come from. And that's yet another kind of reality. Um, I think we forget uh, 80% roughly of Canadians live in a bewilderingly small number of larger cities. Um, the entire rest of the country is 20% wildly underpopulated of people in small communities and each of those communities has its own feel and its own difference and it is a different experience going there and so I was trying to bring worlds together which is a very science fiction thing to do even though a lot of the worlds I'm bringing together are worlds that are just around the corner they're they're people that you could meet uh, but there is an alien so rest assured if you're a science fiction fan uh, <laughs> There is an alien in this novel as well. Yeah, it's, uh, it was very interesting how you brought together all the different worlds and kind of highlighted the differences between uh, people who are actually really close to each other. Like you have the uh, brothers from Michigan, you know, geographically not that far. And then you have the teenagers, the girls from, uh, where were they from? Sarnia? Uh, Chelsea and Patty Rose Point, uh, which which doesn't exist, the, right? But it's yeah, they're from Lake small Rock, town, Davis, small town, yeah, small town, Western Ontario, and yeah, right on the Huron shore. Yeah, and then we've got the Abbots from Sarnia and Sarnia, London, in one case. And, and it's just very interesting how people who are you know geographically and culturally very similar to each other interact with each other and you know what makes them so different from each other <clears throat> so yeah and and in that in that sense it, it, the the jane austen influence is there because it's often been commented i'm not comparing myself to austen as a writer by any means but that sort of realistic but parodic slightly sati slightly satiric edge um of characters who are really from a very small range of the society she lived in. Um, there isn't this Dickensian thing where she's trying to do all levels of society. She's doing a very small thing, and yet we do see the complexity of humanity in that very sort of um, narrow range of, of, of cultures within in, uh, England that she was depicting. And I find that if you do that right, it's both uh, very touching, but it's also funny because people have a penchant to be ridiculous. And I could not do that the way that Austin does it because that's just not who I am or could ever be. But I could do it the way I could do it. Um, and I thought, so this is a different kind of novel, despite those influences, that is doing something similar. It's, it's, uh, it's both celebrating and casting a critical eye on humanity and and I by no means exclude myself from that um, Telfrin is not me but Telfrin is an interesting principal narrator not just because he may be delusional um, or may not be or or else he's in touch with aliens um, which I am not to my knowledge <laughs> uh, but for somebody who is worldly and read science fiction and is very aware of the broader world and the broader universe, Telfrin can be remarkably provincial uh, and narrow at times in his attitudes. And I think that's fascinating because real people are like that. Uh, that sort of game of, yeah, well, my weirdness is more normal than your weirdness. <laughs> and, you know, uh, the strange things that if you're religious, the strange things my religion believes are far more defensible than the strange things that other religion believes. <laughs> no. No, not not in the least. You just happen to believe them, and for all I know, you're right. Um, and Telfrin happens to have his own biases. And if anything like that can be right in a cosmic sense, I don't know. But they are not significantly weirder than anyone else's. Um, and and I think there's there's a lot of humor, and I think there's a lot of tragedy, and, and I think there's dignity in the character as well, even if sometimes we're laughing, and even if at times. Uh, he could be read, uh, I, I just put this out there for readers who are so inclined, he could be read as a standard stand-in for that uh, stereotypical white male writer 
who is writing like he knows about these people when his view is somewhat limited as as all our views are um and and i i invite that i invite both there's a secondary narrator as well but none of them but the other one is not as uh nearly as able uh, uh, nearly as 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 um present as telford telford narrates events where he's not even present and he defends doing that um and maybe he's right but you are you are supposed to occasionally look at him and say maybe maybe not you know and and part of that's part of the fun very nice so Let's talk a little bit about uh, the inspiration for some of the characters, because you've told me that uh, a number of the characters were inspired by like people you've uh, met in real life or people you currently know. Tell me a little bit more about that. Well, it's, it's all over the place, as you know, because you also write. You might start with a real person. Um, you know, for instance, Chelsea is, is and originally had her inspiration in someone who was actually a beta reader for this book, um, but the teenage version of that person. Now, as that person grew into adulthood and Chelsea developed as a character on her own, they went in very different directions, but there are recognizable bits that that's where I started. Um, uh, Augusta is a combination of a few different people, and I am not going to go there. <laughs> um but but she she started with a few different people uh, who are very different, but who I saw some commonalities, and then she again she developed on her own. Um, Patty is fascinating for me. Um, she's one of my favorite characters, and um, she originally came to me with name in a dream. I am not making this up. And Darby, I I don't know if you're 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 here. I'm sure I told you the story years ago. Had a dream where my friend Darby, who was also a beta reader for this, were in a parking lot and we ran into a bunch of people who were having the Patty Washington act alike contest. <laughs> and all of the core elements of the character, she wasn't in the dream, but her name was, and all the core elements of the character were in her, their impersonations of her. And I woke up and said, wow. Um, and wrote down in a writer's journal, beware Patty Washington, <laughs> and wrote about the dream. Uh, and I realized part of her um, elements of her came um, from a friend of mine in high school um, who, who may or may not be out there watching. I don't know. Uh, she's very different from that person. But there's no question I couldn't have written Patty if I had not had that friendship um, in high school with, with Debbie because they have some things in common as well. And uh, so, you know, when you write, they become something else. Telfrin has elements of an acquaintance of mine who is uh, someone I often see at fan events. But again, Telfrin went very much in a direction where they would not be the same person now. But you could say, oh, that's a little bit of that person. And they, they develop in their own direction. Uh, the brothers come the closest. Mark and Thomas come the closest of being. And I did not want to do stereotypes. I did not want to do, good Lord, the Big Bang Theory or anything like that. But the brothers come the closest to being, uh, although they get developed as characters, stand-ins for what um, a lot of people see as the quintessential science fiction fans. One of the reasons they, although they get backstory, they don't get as much backstory, is there's, a, there's an awful lot of science fiction fans who are going to be able to see themselves, uh, male science fiction fans in particular, as one of those two guys. <laughs> um, and probably... Hopefully the one you identify, well, I don't want to spoiler it. Well, uh, um, so, so that is part of the characterization. Um, there were a lot of different people that we influenced Denise, but one of the things that's interesting is I realized, uh, having grown up in a, a street that was predominantly Italian-Canadian, and a lot of my friends were, were first generation, their parents, or at least one of their parents had been immigrants, Denise is from a totally different background, but I wanted to capture some of that that lingering tension that your parents grew up in a different world and you're now living in this one, but you know, you're, you're who you are gestures to that. So she has an element of that. So, so they all came from different places and you know, um, good characters do. Sorry. I'm playing with my light here. <laughs> Look, looked a little bright okay. here. So, uh, 
I'd like to hear more about Patty because she is a, okay. a particularly interesting character and uh, you know she's also uh, a bit unique in the story because uh, she is disabled she has cerebral palsy and uh, I'd like to hear a bit more about like the thoughts or the decisions that led to that and uh, where you know kind of where that came from what uh, what did you base it on or well, the, the, as I said, the character came from a dream, and that character had cerebral palsy, and her walk is is lifted completely from from uh, this this girl I knew in high school, and you know that was a long time ago. She's she's a grandmother now, um, but uh, uh, and and we're in sporadic contact. So a lot of that just I thought that's kind of interesting, and I realized she's extremely bright, and and one of my beta readers, by the way. Um, you know, lives with cerebral palsy and and uh, was very helpful in, in ensuring that I was I was treating um, a quote unquote disability, uh, I hope, sens sensitively. Um, uh, one of the things I find fascinating, uh, those three girls, Patty and Chelsea and Katie, and of course, Katie is there because we need a complete outsider. Katie is beyond mainstream and has never read Jane Austen and she's never been to a science fiction convention and she's hysterically out of her element. Um, and that is helpful for readers who don't have that. She's Dr. Watson in that way. <laughs> she has to be there so people can explain what, what on earth is going on. Um, and yet she's also very, a very strong character. But those three girls, um, I've always said, if you put the three of them together, you'd have a superhuman because Katie is an elite athlete. And uh, Patty is is brilliant, is is a teenage genius, uh, but a plausible teenage genius. Um, I hate fake teenage geniuses. You know, the the kid in the movie who hits three keys and they've hacked the Pentagon or something stupid like that. Uh, I wanted her to be credible. And uh, Chelsea, uh, Patty's best friend, um, is at her core just nice to people. And I thought if you could get those their best qualities together you'd have this this sort of super and i play with that in the background for those of you who are careful readers but of course they're not the sum of those the best of the three of them they're human beings and patty also has some interesting flaws as a character but i was fascinated by the idea of someone who's um who's brilliant 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 smartest person in the room even when she's around the adults um but who has a disability that is rooted in how her brain functions. Um, and that I think is interesting, but she also, I mean, she doesn't consistently make good decisions because she's a human and she's a teenager. Um, and I think that's interesting too. And I think that makes her, you know, more human that you go, yes, yes, she's very bright, but she's just as capable as the rest of us as making boneheaded decisions. And she has a nasty streak. Mm -hmm. She has a nasty streak because she's learned to defend herself against people who either, you know, the one of the girls back at her high school, she overhears saying something. And yes, I did once hear someone say this, uh, says something like, uh, fine, I'll give to the charity. I don't want to have to look at her. And so she has to hear uh, shit like that. And and then. <laughs> She has to hear the other side, um, the people who are saying, um, gee, we should feel sorry for this person. It's like, this person is this person. This person is like all the other characters. And, you know, just, uh, this is really trite and silly, but a huge percentage of our problems, I wouldn't necessarily be solved, but we go a long way towards solving them if we would just get to know each other. Um, and try and, and some people are going to be beyond salvation, I suspect. Uh, but that's not most of us. I don't, I don't think, I hope not. Mm -hmm. And certainly most of the characters in this book, one of the things that was interesting, um, unlike the stories, cause there's two stories that are in this world that accompany the book that are at the back. Uh, there's some nasty pieces of work in those stories. Whereas most of the main characters in the con, I think you'd like most of them. You might not always get on with all of them. Uh, you know, you might say something that annoys Patty and she'll say something really cutting and nasty. Um, and, you know, her friend Chelsea will say, you know what? 
that's kind of a dick thing to do. Um, and so on. And, you know, there's an interesting tension uh, between Telfrin uh, and the, the couple who have driven him there, the lifelong friends, uh, the people who look out for him, because he does live a very liminal kind of existence, sort of on the edge existence. And, uh, and yet there's some tension with them as well that I don't want to get into because that's part of the big part of the book. Um, people can be admirable and not admirable. Um, and most of us have both of those inclinations in us. And I just wanted to be true to the characters. Um, I think if Patty stands out, it's because, um, I think she's very central to the book. Mm -hmm. Um, I think she does feel real. One of the things I set out when I decided I was going to write about that character, I said, the fact that she has a quote unquote disability should be the least interesting thing about her. Right. Mm -hmm. Um, and that's how I tried to approach all of my characters. Even if this character has something that would be, you know, a movie of the week issue. Um, no, that's not who they are. And that's, that's part of them. But that should be the least interesting thing about that character. There should be a ton of other things that are far more interesting and far more compelling than a person's uh, physical nature or their uh, their sexuality or what whatever. Uh, all of those things shape who they are, of course, mm. of course, of course. But if that's the only thing you know the character from, they're not a very good character. Um, they're 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 uh, you know and. So despite some of the games I'm playing with the nature of those three female friends, teenage friends, um, they are meant first and foremost to be believable, even if they all have exceptionalities. Um, I've certainly known any number of, of, of elite athletes, and, and indeed I have a niece who's one. Maybe, maybe she's watching this. I don't know. Um, but if you know them as people, yes, it's amazing that they can do what they do. I had two former students who went to the Olympics, wow. um, one of whom got a gold medal. Uh, but honestly, if I think back to them, yes, athletically, they were incredibly gifted, but there were 10 other things that were worth talking about, you know, and yes, Patty has to make some accommodations for the way she walks, but that's hardly what the character is about, mm -hmm. you know. And and so I don't know if that answers your question or if it's putting people to sleep, but but that's <laughs> well, that's uh, that's an answer. I, I do like how you uh, put so much into her, and I think uh, I would definitely say that you succeeded. That you know, the cerebral palsy for Patty is the least interesting thing about her, and uh, you go into a bit more of her character in Trollbridge, which comes after the yes. con in the book. And uh, I also found that uh, a very interesting story and uh, just really neat getting into the background and the history on those characters and kind of how they ended up, you know, the way they are today or at the point of the book. Well, and, and Trollbridge really, uh, had, have, I ne have I never written Trollbridge? And it was revised signif you know, significantly to fit in with the con a little better. Uh, once I wrote the con, but if I'd never written Trollbridge, I would never have written the con because, you know, Patty and her friends come out of that. But then uh, there's a character named Kurt who also plays a very small role in the con. He's a tertiary at best, but he's very important in Trollbridge. I realized when I started writing the con that Telfrin would be a contemporary of Kurt and his friends. So I simply <laughs> simplified things by saying Telfrin was a member of that group. He was a friend of Kurt's years ago, and uh, and Brian and Augusta Slesic, um, who drive Telfrin to and from the con, um, came out of Trollbridge. Although they're they're minor minor characters there, they're just people who are in Kurt's past at, at that point. Um, so, but for those of you who who haven't looked at the book, um, it gets a little bit of extra length by two additional stories, and Trollbridge is involves a story in Patty's life that takes place before and after actually the con because it happens over several years and uh, there's a flashback in Telfrin's life that's pretty important and there's a story called uh, Do You See What I See 
which is that event told from the point of 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 other people and then it develops what what led to that event which we don't see in the con we just know that this thing happened to Telfrin um, and it was kind of traumatizing versus these are the people that created the trauma and this is this is what happened to one of them um, and it's it's um I suppose it stands as an example of a Christmas story that is not about redemption. <laughs> <laughs> Indeed. And so, so hey, I guess it, 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 it's got that going for it. <laughs> so did you write the con first before Do You See What I See then? Kind of simultaneously. I'd had the first draft of the con. And then I said, I want to write, develop this. And I realized I was developing it in a way that had nothing to do with the con, like in terms of being part of the con. So I, I just wrote a separate story, which then I submitted it one place that rejected it and, and an early version of it. And I just thought, I'm going to hold on to this because I'm working on the con and that may change things a bit. Um, so it is, it is interesting how that kind of thing can happen with your writing. You start expanding sort of the world. Uh, there are, as, as you know, there's hopefully a collection coming out in, in the, you know, in the next year or so, um, perhaps, um, and there are two other stories that are, if you will, in the con universe. Um, and, and one of them was actually shortlisted for the Klonsky novella contest. And then they did win. And then they said, but, but we'll publish this. And and then they didn't. <laughs> they about like months later, they got back to me and said, yeah, we changed our mind. But it's good. you know. And it's hard to sell a novella. So hopefully that'll go in a collection um, that, that I'm, I'm working on that includes some some previously published stuff and some original stuff but but two of those stories are are from the con universe and i like that idea of expanding just like i think it would be very interesting to take a zogo of of Urtkuyaki, our alien and expand that because there is so much um background that you get as the con is read about a zogo's world about Urtkuyaki and the inhabitants of Urtkuyaki, who have their origins <laughs> although uh, I developed them quite a bit in just kind of a thought experiment I did like years and years and years ago uh, where I was trying to think of an alien race that would make a, that could be done as a mobile self-contained costume, um, but that wouldn't be humanoid. And it kind of got off base. It turned into to the Earth Kuiya. But they're kind of interesting as an alien race because they're enough like us that they can kind of understand us. But there, there are things about the two races that we'll never understand. And when you put a group of humans, however diverse, beside something that is aggressively not human, we just all look like people, right? <laughs> um, it's, it's, the differences shrink because you're looking at a, you know, a six-limbed, um, uh, hermaphroditic species. Mm. Yeah, there's a kind of a cartoon. Yeah. You got to hold it up a bit more. Um, so that's uh, on the con badge. You got to move it up a bit. But uh, there's a there's a kind of a cartoon drawing of what they look like uh, at the bottom of the con badge on the title, and uh, they can they get us, but they don't get us. And of course, they have absolutely no concept of gender, like whatsoever, because they're they're like snails that way. They're male and female all the time, and they can cross impregnate each other if that's what they choose to do. So there is simply there there just isn't even a social concept of gender. It doesn't exist for them, and they find this fascinating <laughs> that that this is a thing that there's not only separate sexes on Earth, which they can kind of get. There's a construct that goes with gender that simply doesn't even make sense to them. This It's not a thing. A social construct. Um, yeah, and whatever else it is, right? I mean, because we're still digging through that. But yeah, heavily a social construct that just, why would you need this? <laughs> um, I think human beings, well, most human beings, this is fairly important to our identity. Um, but... So there's and there's a number of other differences where they, they're small when they but when you get the interactions, you realize we're tripping over difference because, you know, this is this is an alien whether whether Telfrin's made it up or it's actually there, um, this is something that's not us and and that's that's 
often been explored by science fiction. How would we deal with, uh, you know, not these sort of Federation aliens with, you know, that look like they have gum stuck on their forehead and, you know, they frequently conform to all of our social and gender norms except for maybe one trait that's different. Mm -hmm. uh, but a lot of written science fiction deals with what would real aliens be like and how would we deal with that because the ground rules would be so aggressively different. Mm -hmm. And, and so some of the best science fiction deals with how do you, how would we start to communicate? Uh, sure. You know, so uh, we embassy town, mm -hmm. embassy town, uh, China Mayville is a, is an interesting example of alien and human interaction, where we can communicate, but boy, the ground rules don't don't match, <laughs> and it creates a lot of difficulty. So we have a good question from the chat here uh, asking, okay. I, I'm not going to attempt to uh, say the name, but uh, asking, did you write the con sequentially or did different parts flow at different times and you had to connect them later? Yes. Um, <laughs> so it was, uh, it, it was uh, different parts, especially initially. When I write something, uh, anything, I usually start with what's most interesting to me at the time. And then when I've got enough bits, I start writing sequentially. But in the con, which is such a chaotic carnivalesque novel, um, I, that was just a natural for writing it. And a lot of it does really flow. I know it becomes very crazy at the end, but by then you know who you're dealing with. Um, if you read, you know, the first, say, um, eight chapters. There's a, they could almost be one chapter, even though we're going all over the place. They just kind of flow, and uh, I, I, I did note that although I did, we did get a positive review for the novel at Publishers Weekly. They did say, "Wow, parts of it are, parts of it become convoluted, um, and because there's an unreliable narrator." And I thought, mm, "Parts of it do become a little convoluted, but that's part of the fun. I mean, it's supposed to be a fun novel, mm -hmm. and." It doesn't exist separate of its unreliable narrator, you know. Um, and that's true of a lot of obviously very great books. I'm not going to call this a say that this is a great book. Um, I, I hope someone will, but but I'm not going to say it. But a lot of really great works of literature. I mean, uh, I mean, Lolita is considered one of the the great novels of the 20th century, and it rests on a narrator who is so unreliable. A number of people. Uh, though they're a little bit creepy, I think, have taken him just at face value. Um, that he's, oh, this is just a great love story. It, no, it's not. Um, don't trust anything this guy is telling you. And Telford isn't that level of unreliable in the sense of being uh, ethically um, compromised to that degree. But you're not sure how much his take on the world has been compromised. Um, be it because the aliens are actually inter uh, an alien device from far away is, is using him to see us or because, and, and that's creating some, some issues with his, his processing, or if point in fact, <laughs> this is just a product of uh, an error, uh, a problem with his brain. And, uh, and we simply, you have to kind of wait to the end and even then, well, I'm gonna. I'm not gonna spoil my own novel. <laughs> Read the book. <laughs> That's right. So, you told me uh, before we started streaming that uh, this book went through a lot of different revisions uh, prior to the point that it is now. Do you want to tell us a little bit about the process that led to uh, the story being what it is published now? Well, what you saw, and as you know, we made a lot of tweaks, um, and, and I still spotted one error when I was rereading. It was just a tense shift. Uh, it was very minor. Uh, oh, geez, I gave it away now. <laughs> um, but uh, there were this. What you saw was the third draft. There was the first draft I gave to um, whatever powers that be, bless them. Uh, uh, some of my my favorite beta readers, and uh, they got back to me with some feedback, and I realized this is a mess. Um, and then I rewrote it, and I thought, okay, this is actually a book I would read if someone else wrote it, but it's flawed. And then before I sent it out, uh, I did 
a sort of an overfall, over, overhaul to smooth it out. And really, none of the changes we made were major, no. but they were things that enhanced it. They were errors. They were things that weren't clear enough. And a good example, if you're talking about writing, about how a small thing can, I think, really add a lot. Uh, the last, probably the last change that was made kind of bugged me that, that at no point did I ever say Patty has short hair. Oh, yeah, that's exciting. Why the hell do we need to know that? And I started thinking about that. I started saying, where would I even say that? And I realized, here, we're almost at the end of the novel. And she's in a, a more softer, if still comedic, uh, gentler, sensitive, intimate kind of situation. And we hear that she has a pixie cut. And pixie and that character are not two things that, that would normally be in the same sentence. And it's this moment where somebody is just kind of seeing her and and sort of has gotten to know her and is saying, hey, this is a really interesting person. And that moment, I think, kind of that, that tiny detail solidifies that as we're now seeing we're now seeing her, but we're also seeing one detail about her that we we didn't particularly know and probably didn't care about and could have gotten through the book without. But uh, um I can't give you more on that because I don't want to give away that's really close to the end. But it was a detail that to me, I thought that whole scene is just so much improved by one sentence. And I think uh, we all know this with the, when we read, uh, you, you, you come across one sentence that's just perfect or funny or heartbreaking and you go, you know what? Uh, this book was worth it. <laughs> Just for the fact that that happened and that sentence, I'm not saying that the example I gave is an example of that, but you have enough pretty good sentences, <laughs> and 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 maybe uh, maybe it goes somewhere that's that's uh, worth reading. And I think, like I said, I would read this. I hope you would, but uh, I obviously can't um, can't make that decision for anyone. Other than I, I encourage you to buy the book. Yes, please do, and uh, it is available on brain-lag.com our website uh, it's also available in major bookstores Amazon if you're uh, doing Amazon that type of thing Barnes and Noble um, uh, found us on an uh, Australian site that, that sells books to Australia so so that's kind of cool when when um, that was brought to my attention I thought oh that's that's kind of cool that that exists mm -hmm. Uh, Waterstones, I believe one of the bigger bookstores, uh, bookstore chains in the UK also uh, comes up pretty frequently if you search for the book. So how about uh, we take a little break for a reading from the con? Oh, we, we, we could do that. <laughs> 